We're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to go with verse 10 through verse 18. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and against, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, having uh, on the breastplate of righteousness and on your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helm of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so we have our text. You know, deciding to evangelize, and really there shouldn't be a decision to be made. We're Christians, and that's what we do. But deciding to evangelize the world is a decision, literally, to go to war. Jesus promised in the Great Commission to be with his disciples always to the end of the age because he knew they would need his presence in order to withstand the rigors of doing spiritual warfare. When he commanded them to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 18, verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 18 and following, he knew full well that he was sending most of them to a violent death on the battlefield. Now in the first century, that was literally true. Many of them were persecuted unto death. We are in a spiritual battle and many die spiritually because they are overcome by the wicked one. Their consolation was in knowing that Jesus would accompany them everywhere they went to preach and that he would be with them also in the hour of their death. Somehow we've forgotten that world evangelism means that God's people are at war. Paul never forgot it. And his missionary books are full of language of battle. Notice some of his statements to Timothy. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5. When Paul was near the end of his life, he reviewed that life as a war and said, I have fought a good fight, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. He spoke with calm assurance about the ultimate victory he expected by saying, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and with, will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18. Paul never forgot, not for a moment, that he was a soldier of Christ, and that evangelism, warfare, was his assignment. And that is our assignment as well. Warfare is also our assignment. Specifically, when we set out to face the world and to evangelize the world, we become a part of a battle for the minds of men. Literally, for the mind of man. God has always viewed his redemptive work with mankind as a battle of the mind. We see this fact in his work with Abraham. 
It was when, when a childless and aged Abraham believed the promise of God that he said he would give Abraham descendants. As difficult to number as the stars of heaven that God's won that battle for the mind of Abraham. God had to convince Abraham that in his old age, he would yet be a father. Remember, he doubted that at first, but then he came around and understood the will of God. Remember Sarah, when she was listening from inside the tent, she laughed at the fact that in her old age, she was going to be with child. God won the mind of Abraham. Moses therefore said of Abraham that he believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15 and verse 6. God also wanted Abraham to do spiritual battle for the minds of his family. We remember that God kind of debated him with himself as, as to whether he would tell Abraham that he would destroy Sodom because remember Lot was there. In the course of that decision, God reveals Abraham's secret mission. He says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which has spoken of him. Genesis 18 and verse 19. God's great plan for Abraham, the father of the faithful, and the one through whom the seed of the Messiah was to come into the world, was to struggle to win the minds of his children, of his household after him. So deeply did Abraham influence the thoughts of those within his charge that here thousands of years later, we still feel his influence. That's how well Abraham did his job of winning the minds of his children. The purpose of the battle. When we battle for the mind of men and women, we are seeking to change the way they think. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down a stronghold. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In this text, we have two statements that are pertinent to our discussion. Two expressions. The first one, casting down strongholds. That's, that's our purpose, to cast down strong. Well, what does that mean? Are we going to go and, and, and fight nations and conquer nations? Are we going to, to go up and besiege castles and, and uh, uh, overthrow castles? Is that what we're going to do? Throw down strongholds? Is that what it is? This literally means we demolish arguments. That's what the Greek literally means here. This is a well-fortified position that somebody holds and we tear it down. We're in the battle for the minds of men. And we have to tear down their arguments. We need to pull down their strongholds. And then the second expression is really probably more specific and evident to us than the first. We bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. These are powerful affirmations. They're the language of war. They describe our mission in the world. Some people believe they can do evangelist, evangelistic work and never cross swords with anyone. 
Paul had no such illusions about the work of preaching the gospel. He knew that his job was to turn men's hearts to Christ and help them develop into maturity under the measure of stature of Christ, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. And to accomplish this task, he further knew that nothing short of changing their ideas, their thoughts, their conclusions about reality would move them to become like Jesus Christ. Our society often looks down on people who try to change others into the image of Christ. Just stand up against transgenderism. Stand up against this cultural war that we're fighting on morality. We live in a time that is known as cancel culture if you stand up for what is right and moral against the ideas of what are popular the enemy will destroy you or at least try they will try to get you fired they will try to discredit your name they will try to cause you to suffer we may not be killed physically outright like they were in the first century. But there are some things worse than physical death. Jesus warned, don't fear those that can destroy the body. But destroy him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's the one we need to fear. We approve advertising and i'm talking about we as a culture as a society we approve advertising that changes people's mind about certain products our media coverage that blurs the difference between right and wrong our movies that change ideas from traditional moral values to a viewpoint of moral relativity to change a person's thinking in such a way that he wants to imitate the attitudes and actions of Jesus Christ, however, often appears to our hostile culture as a narrow and bigoted approach to life. In this attitude, American society in 2023 is little different from the society that flourished in Bible times. Doing battle to change a person's spiritual values was perhaps as out of favor in the first century as it is today. Paul, however, did not let the cultural mindset deter him from demolishing arguments and taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. He knew that he would uh, that that uh, he knew that world evangelism had to take place at the rational level or it did not take place at all. It's not about touchy-feely the way some denominations want to make it, the feeling in your heart. We battle for the minds of men in order to win the heart. It doesn't start in the heart. We battle the minds of men and cultivate the heart to receive the word of God. That's our mission. That's our battle. To win the mind so that we can influence the heart. First, many who would evangelize do not like to do the tough thinking that must be done in order to capture erroneous thinking and make it obedient to Christ. It takes work to be effective in evangelism. And we're in the battle for the minds of men and we need to do our work, our homework, to prepare ourselves to be in that battle. Wherever we go, we will find the brightest minds preaching and defending false doctrines. Therefore, we may, must be as well prepared mentally and spiritually as possible in order to preach the word of God 
convincingly enough that people would change their minds and accept Jesus Christ and his plan. The battle over spiritual ideas will be a tough one, especially when the world's most intellectual are proclaiming and defending false doctrine. Experience has taught us that the brightest people are most always the most effective false teachers. Remember, Apollos was an eloquent man. Only Bible, only person in the Bible referred to as eloquent. And guess what? He was a false teacher. Had to be corrected. It's a good thing he was able to be corrected. In order to change their minds or the minds of their disciples, well, we must do painstaking mental and spiritual work in order to demolish their arguments and take captive their thoughts through the preaching of God's word. We must never underestimate the intelligence of religious leaders, politicians, entertainers, sports figures. You know, it seems to me that we put too much stock in people just because they're famous. Just because somebody's a good actor doesn't make them smart. It's not an intelligence quotient that goes along with that job. Just because somebody may be a good football player doesn't mean he's intelligent. It just means he's athletic. I'm not saying athletics and intelligence don't go together, but it's not guaranteed. But it seems like a good portion of the society that we live in is willing to accept the entertainment industry and whatever they say. Never forget a movie I was watching one time and, and a, a guy, I think it was The Hunt for Red October. Jack Ryan was in a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff and was giving them some uh, intelligence report on a submarine. And during the course of the meeting, he pops off and makes a pretty bold statement. The meeting breaks up and the guy running the meeting asks him to stay. He comes up and says, I'm a politician. And that means I'm a liar and a cheat. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. Why do we think they have the answers? Why do we listen to them? We watch talk show, television. We expect them to have the answers. Those are the people we need to be trying to battle against to win their minds. And we see we got our work cut out for us. All of these whom I've mentioned are or have been in the past notorious for proclaiming ideas that undermine the moral and our spiritual teaching of Jesus Christ. Our own people often fall prey to their teachings. By our own people, I mean those in the Lord's church. Our warfare is to evangelize and teach God's word so powerfully that the true message of Jesus takes captive false concepts and makes them submit to Jesus Christ. Another reason that our warfare is so difficult. It is difficult to do battle for the mind of man because we've neglected the battle for so long. That unbelievable changes have taken place in the thought pattern and value system of many Americans. We know how false teaching in society has changed basic concepts concerning marriage and the home. We're fully aware of the havoc wreaked by the sexual revolution. We have all suffered the pain of drunkenness and drug addiction either in our own personal lives or in those around us. We know what it is to live in fear of AIDS and other socially transmitted diseases. And we know the fear of being out in the street late at night because we have neglected evangelism and failed to teach the thoughts of Jesus, 
The thinking of evil men and women has gradually pervaded and almost overcome our society. Witchcraft, Marxism, secular humanism, Satanism, spiritualism, liberation theology, communism, denominationalism, new age religion, atheism, eastern religion, and the list could go on and on. Radical feminism and pure hedonism have changed the way this nation and the world thinks. The longer we neglect the battle for the mind of men, the more difficult it becomes to demolish arguments and take captive the thoughts to make it obedient to Christ. We need to understand the nature of the enemy. <clears throat> it is vital that we recognize the nature of the enemy we face in the battle for the minds of men. The great spiritual warrior Paul knew exactly who the enemy was. In our text, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It comes from our text, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. We're always tempted to think the enemy, uh, think of the enemy in human forms. Some of our brethren believe that other brethren are the enemy. Well, that may be indeed the case in certain situations, but Satan must surely laugh when he sees us exhausting our energies doing battle with one another, splitting hairs, writing hate mail, publishing yellow journalism may make us feel like warriors, but these things will win us no praise from God since he knows who the real enemy is. The real enemy is Satan and his host. It is the invisible world that must concern us in our battle for the mind of man. Satan is the real enemy and he is behind every evil change in our society. Human beings who join with him are nothing but pawns in his hands. It is precisely because the real enemy is the invisible, invisible Satan that the weapons of our spiritual warfare are not made by men. So let's look at the nature of our weapons. Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. One of the reasons we have been losing so many spiritual battles in America and throughout the world is that we have been using the wrong weapons. Politics is the wrong weapon for fighting spiritual battles. I'm not saying that we should stay out of politics when moral and spiritual issues are involved, but I am saying that any victory won through politics can vanish by popular vote or pressure as quickly as it was won. It seemed almost impossible to overturn Roe versus Wade, and yet it was overturned. But you know what? 50 years down the road, they may overturn the overturn. Just depends on who's sitting on that bench. That's what it amounts to. We can't trust government to win our battle. Well, I greatly admire the people who fight pornography in whatever legitimate way they can. We will not win lasting victory over smut until we demolish the arguments and capture the thoughts of publishers and sellers and make their thoughts obedient to Jesus Christ. Our task to evangelize the pornographers. I asked somebody one time, would you take the gospel to a homosexual? They said, no. That's who we need to be going to. 
We don't need to just say homosexuality is wrong. We need to go convert the homosexuals. We need to tear down their arguments and bring their thoughts into submission to Jesus Christ so that they'll obey. That's why we fail. Courts and judges are the wrong weapon for fighting spiritual battles. I cannot fault people who seek to protect our values through court decisions, but I do not believe we will find ultimate moral and spiritual solution to society's ills by relying on judges, even the Supreme Court judges. I wish that the Supreme Court had never decided in favor of abortion, but it did. It seems highly it seemed highly unlikely for a number of years that that would ever be overturned but it has and that just goes to demonstrate how fickle human kind is it just depends on who's in power at the time what you're going to get and there's no guarantee that moral people will always be in charge And so, instead of wringing our hands or throwing in the towel, we must get busy teaching and preaching to this nation that abortion is a sin against God and against humanity. If the church had been doing its teaching job effectively, there is a strong possibility that the Supreme Court may never have given a favorable opinion on this issue in the first place. Had the church accomplished its task to destroy arguments and take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, people would not have availed themselves of such a solution for unwanted pregnancy. It is preaching and teaching that will recapture the heart's of men and women and turn them to God. Public schools are the wrong weapon for fighting spiritual battles. It infuriates me that we can teach almost anything we choose in public schools except basic fundamental moral principles that are taught in the Bible. Not only is teaching Christian ethics prohibited, Immorality, such as critical race theory, transgenderism, which allows boys to go into the girls' locker room naked. And by the way, I heard a situation the other day where there's a 13-year-old girl, I think, in her girls' locker room. Transgender comes in, naked in front of her, traumatizes her. And you know what the, the school and the psychiatrist said? That girl needs to go get therapy. The girl who was traumatized by the transvestite, the transgenderite, she's the one with the problem. You think we need to tear down that argument? You need to think we need to bring into captivity their thoughts into submission and obedience to Jesus Christ? That's the only way we're going to win the battle because the school system seems to be bent on standing on the side of immorality every time. Society, whether our government or our court system, seems bent on standing for immorality every time. That's not the place that we're going to win the battle. I long for the days when Christian teachers can help shape the moral and spiritual values of the students in their classrooms. But I'm almost sure, however, that those days are over and that it will take a miracle to reset time back to that day. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Christians are not powerless. There's still the body of Christ. There's still evangelism. There's still the proclamation of God's word. 
There's still the battle for the minds and thoughts of men. There's still the possibility that fearless preaching of God's word will make a difference. And I'm not just talking about from here, from the pulpit, although that is necessary, it's essential. But I'm talking about preaching in the lives of every Christian out there. Making a difference in society and standing up for the truth and speaking what's right. When Christians carry out this mission effectively, a world that is sick of its own sin and degradation will have the chance to learn and hopefully turn its heart back to God. We Christians are in the battle for the minds of men and it's not a battle that we can afford to lose. So we think about this idea. People outside the body of Christ, they can't make a change. Because they don't know how to. We need to teach them the gospel and take them out of the world into the body of Christ and teach them moral principles so that they can join the fight for the minds of men. We need to teach them about Jesus Christ so that they can have faith in Him and teach them what Christ requires in order to be saved. We need to teach them to turn from the sin in their life, to leave it behind and embrace the right life in Jesus Christ. We need to teach them that they need to confess the name of Jesus Christ before men and live that life. And finally, they need to be baptized for remission of their sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And as Christians, they can join the battle Unfortunately, in the battle for the minds of men, sometimes we have casualties along the way. Sometimes our members give in to the thoughts of the world and the temptation of our enemy, the devil. And they go back into the world. We need to battle for their mind too. We need to tear down their arguments. They need to bring their thoughts into captivity. So that they can be obedient to Christ and be restored. Encourage them to repent and pray. This morning we're going to offer the invitation. And if you're subject to the invitation, we're battling for your mind right now. We're encouraging you to make the right decision to change your mind from a mind that is governed by the world to a mind that's governed by Jesus Christ. Paul begged the church at Rome in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can do that only if you're a Christian. Obey the gospel. Be restored. Whatever you need, we invite you to come forward when we stand and sing.